Where is God? Have you ever felt the presence of God? He blows me away that since the dawn of time, God has wanted to be with us, to be amongst us. In Exodus 29 verse 42 it says, For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet you and speak to you. There I will also meet with the Israelites, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Mark 16:15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. My name is Blake and I'm the lead pastor here. If you're new around here, we sure are glad that you came. And we hope you already feel right at home. And anybody that's joined us online all all around the world, thanks for being a part of all that God's doing here and being a part of our family. Um, Man, Will you guys do something for me? Will you give the band a big shout out and just give them a hand? They're they're doing such a good job. That team is so talented and they're doing a great job. And I do have to say it's been pretty great having my own daughters lead lead me into worship. That's been wonderful. So um, I do have a quick announcement. And that is that uh, we are searching for a youth pastor. And we had Casey come and speak. And at the end of the weekend, um, we both of us just didn't feel like it was God's will. And he's way more than qualified. He's amazing. He's like my son, and I love him. But at the end of the day, I just need you to know as your pastor, I want God's will. And um, I, I want God to bring the guy that's supposed to be here for that. And so I just ask you to pray. Keep praying. He'll, he'll bring the guy. He's got a better plan than we ever dream or imagine, right? So I'm not worried. I'm not fretting. But um, I, I just feel like God's bringing the right people around here to build a team that he wants. And um, not, not only that, this house is full today, and he's bringing a whole lot of new folks, new families, and, and it's growing. It's amazing to see that. Yeah, all glory to God. So, fired up. So we're in a series right now called The Church Has Left the Building. And so if you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to go back. I talked about our creator God, and we talked about how he's masterful in the way that he makes stuff. I talked about how he makes giraffes talked about elephants, and I talked about how I think he stepped on the face of a platypus, and um, I I talked about sort of how he's creative, and um, I I just wanted to add one more thing that I didn't bring up last week that I think is just like amazing. So it's fun to me to think that when I see creation, I delight in God, right? I do. I see like oceans and the stars, and I go, dude, I love you, God. But I love the other idea of that, and that is that when God made the stuff, he was delighting in us, right? As he was making it, he was going, oh, they're going to dig this. And one of my favorite things to think about is, is a firefly. I don't know if you've thought about that, but it is a bug that flies, and it has a light in its butt. <laughs> That's amazing. And so my kids, from the time they're this big, like, Daddy, they run and they catch it, right? Because they, I think he made them so they could be caught by little kids because they're so slow. He's like, I'm going to make it so slow so kids can grab it. And they go, Daddy, look, I caught a firefly. Look at it, Daddy. It, it, so to make a home for his kids, make a place that's extravagant so he could be with us. And we learned a little bit last week about the history of Israel. Sort of like a 30,000 foot view of God. And how he chose to bless um, his chosen nation, Israel, uh, his children, through, through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then they were led into captivity. And they went to Egypt and they were in strict bondage. They were, they were slaves to Pharaoh. And they were, making, they were making all these, you know, idols that were images of of Pharaoh, and, and they, they, they were cow, they, they took care of cows, right? So they, they were herders and shepherds, and they were also brick makers, and they were just, whatever they needed, they had to work for Pharaoh. And so they finally get set free from that, and God does these mighty works, right? And I talked about that, all the different plagues he sent, he parts the Red Sea, and 
They're finally in the desert together. And they're like, yes, we're family. We're here. And then God, God's like meeting with them. He shows up. And cloud by day and fire by night. And his manifest glory came from heaven to earth. In the tent of meeting, there is this, this cloud. We don't understand what it was. Some people call it the Shekinah glory. The, the, the Shekinah, the glory of God. Is, he was with his kids. And so finally, we see God with his, with his family. He's having a big family reunion and today we're going to pick up from there and sort of look at this story of God. Uh, but I, I want to start with sort of my story and the story I have with my kids. As a dad, it's a blast being a dad. I love being a dad. But right now, I'm kind of going through a little bit of a hard season. And that is because my oldest daughter, who my whole family is here today on the front row, I love this. And my, my oldest daughter, Madison, is getting married on September 27th. So, yeah, one month away, and she's marrying that dude who's a good-looking dude. And um, he's a Marine, he's a stud, and I'm just so happy to have a son. Finally, I've got a boy! So, anyways, yeah, yeah, amazing. And so, Madison's whole life, I've been the man. But in a month, I'm going to give her away, and Tipton's going to be the man. And I'm okay with that. But this past week, my daughter spent one week with, with us. She came up to spend time with mom and dad, and it was wonderful. She doesn't know how much I was actually crying when she wasn't looking. And so I was like taking her on walks and holding her hand. And we um, had long talks and cuddled on the couch. I'm going to try not to cry. We um, went to the movies together and um, had long conversations. And um, we worshiped together. We laughed and we sang and played and it was a wonderful gift from God to me to get to just delight in my daughter and to have a blast with her. It was kind of like her last week before she's no longer mine. And I think that's really all that God wanted, right? He made all this and sacrificed everything for his kids so that one day we'll grow up and live our lives for him and for his glory, right? And so that's always been the heart of God is to say, I'll be your God and you'll be my people, right? Right? And what that really means, that's a thesis statement sort of through the whole Old Testament. It said 28 different times. And every single time, what he's really saying is, hey, kids, I'm here. I adore you. I love you. And as a dad in today's world, it's hard for me. Because this place is evil and it's dark, isn't it? There's so much despair and hatred and people are mean, critical. They judge everything. And, and, and everybody against everybody else. And it's just, ah. So raising up kids in today's world is scary. It's like, I, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be like God. I don't want you to turn out just like me. I want you to turn out like him. We bear his image. And, and so it's, it's assuring to me to know that God loves my kids more than I do. And I can send them out in the world trusting that he's got them. But my kids are also spirit led. And that's why it's so trusting for me. They love God and they follow after his word. Every one of them are, are spirit led and they are God, God's kids. They're kingdom minded warriors. All of you. And so I can't take care of my kids like God can. And I don't know where your, your kids are in their walk with God. But here's, here's how I'm feeling these days. Is I'm feeling like, man, I, I can't protect them like I used to be able to. I can't fight for them like I used to be able to. And now that two of them are, are no longer in my house or in my nest, uh, I, I'm realizing something that has always been the case, but I just feel it more now. And that is that I don't have any control. None. And I try my hardest to control my kids. I'm, I really do. But I can't control the, my own kids in my own house. And if I'm honest, I can't control myself hardly. And so this, this idea of control, it's such a joke. It's so funny to think that we're really in control of anything. And so it makes me sometimes feel like I, I just want to protect them and keep them safe, but I can't. I can't keep my kids safe. 
And following after God and doing His will is never safe. God didn't call you to follow after Him and say, it's going to be really safe, kids. He didn't say that. God said, follow after me, and there's a possibility you could die. You're going to lose your life for my sake, and there's a possibility you'll be persecuted even unto death. That's what the Bible teaches us. Through all of Old Testament and New Testament. And so living in God's will is never safe. And and at the same time, being with God in His presence, wrapped in His arms, is the very safest place that you can be. Let me say it like this. You're safe, not because of the absence of danger, but because of the presence of God. Whew! Somebody say, preach, Pastor Blake. Control is nothing more than an illusion. We want to act like I'm in control, but God's sovereign. He's in control, and if I'm in His presence, I'm safe, man. I'm not in danger. We, we like to think that we're the king running my kingdom, man. I'm the king. I got a crown. Bow down. Right? We like to act like I'm in control. But listen, can I just say to you, your kingdom is a joke. We like to think that our kingdom is the big deal. But in comparison with the grandeur of God, a timeless God, an everlasting God, that is establishing His kingdom on planet Earth, you guys understand that, right? That God is the King, and we get to grow His kingdom. He asks us to partner with Him and grow an everlasting kingdom. But instead, we're kind of obsessed with my own kingdom, my own house, my own car. I'm going to get a nicer car, a bigger house. I'm going to grow my business. My kingdom's going to be great. But man, come on. When you're in God's power and in His presence, it's always when you know, man, listen, you're right where you're supposed to be, but you're not safe. If you've ever had a moment with God, that's how you feel. Like a time when God showed up in your life. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever had that? Raise your hand. A few of you have. So when you're in the presence of God, there's this funny thing that happens in in, in God's presence. Sometimes you just like start laughing. There's just joy, like unspeakable, just joy. And then at the same time, you can find yourself like tears coming out. Because you also recognize God's just and holy and good and righteous, and I'm not. And so to be in his presence is also this sort of fear of like, you're good. You're good. And there's usually this, this feeling of like my truest sense in life of belonging is when I'm lost in the presence of God. It's how we learn who we really are. So I want you to say this statement with me. You ready? Say, I know who I am because I know whose I am. That's right. When we're lost in the presence of the one that made us, when we're kind of wrapped in the arms of our father who created me, It's when we experience the greatest sense of this belonging. He knows us fully and he loves us anyways. He's our Abba Father, which means Daddy. We are his beloved children. He's handcrafted each of us and he doesn't make any mistakes. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And the response to that's clear. Adoration and praise is the only response to the living God that would create us only to love and delight in us. If you really believe that God created me just to delight in me, just to like love me, that's overwhelming. If you really believe that, it changes everything. This church will light on fire. When you go, man, he made me just to, whoo, worship you, praise you. In fact, let's do something. Will you guys give God a big shout of praise and just give him a clap and make it? Come on. All glory to you, God. Thank you for making us. And praise you, Jesus. Careful now. We're going to get a little Pentecostal up in here. Brene Brown said this, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. None of us like to say, I need you, I need you. It feels so needy. (laughs) But but you know what? I need you. It's ridiculous to act like I don't. We are biologically, cognitively, 
physically and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. You know what happens? We break. We fall apart. We numb. We ache. We hurt others. And we actually get sick. Without having love, man, we get sick. In all kinds of ways. This is why I care about small groups so much. This is why this house has to be a house that brings people into your homes and we know each other. I care a lot more that you're sitting in circles, knee to knee, face to face, than being in rows. Being in rows is great. But if I'm the only one that's loving you and feeding you the gospel and teaching the scriptures, then that's not enough. You won't, you won't stick and you won't experience what the family of God's supposed to be. You won't stay. The way that you'll, you'll stay is if you're known. And it's okay to be known. Like all of us are broken. You, all of you are a hot mess. The more I hear your stories, like, wow, it's worse than I thought. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you. <laughs> but... It's the same with me. The more you hear my story, like, what kind of pastor we got? <laughs> We're broken. But when we invite each other into each other's story, then you're loved and you're, you're known and you get to love back. And I, I want you to function as you were meant to. And part of life is that there's this deep sense of loneliness. Each of us feel it. I mean, sometimes God feels so big, and I just feel so small. And it's kind of like the universe. And I think that's why he placed us here. In this Milky Way alone, in our little neighborhood, like, Earth is tiny. But I think that's actually how we feel as humans. Like, we're made in the image of God. We bear the image of God. And create, he created us to understand him. And God's huge. And yet, sometimes my soul feels so vast my soul feels so big like because I think there's God in my soul and so sometimes in my own soul in a day in one day I feel so like overwhelmed by the tiny things that I face and yet I also feel so connected to God it's so weird so so each of us from the time we're created um, we we want to have God in our lives, and we see Him in creation, you can't deny God, and yet sometimes connecting with Him feels so big and hard to understand, and sometimes we're lost in the desert of our own soul. And yet, we recognize you're in control, you're king, but you know what? I want to be king. Uh, we've always wanted to be in charge, and for some of us that are control freaks, we want answers, right? I want to know, what, what, what's the plan? What's, show me the plan. Right, I need the steps right in front of me. Show me the steps. Right, I need to give me, show me where the money's at. Right, before you tell me your plans, I need to see all the things first. And then that's not the way God works. God says, go. There's no plan. Just do what I said. What? I, I, I don't like that. Right? Sometimes doing God's calling and his purpose for my life can be paralyzing. Because trusting and hoping that God will lead us where he wants us to be and guiding us can feel like I'm out of control. Like I'm supposed to trust you to guide me? Hold on. I, I guide me. I'm good at guiding me. And I trust me. And I'll guide me. Thank you. But I got it. And can I just step on some toes and tick people off Amen. for a second and preach a little bit? So sometimes Christians are known for like saying, Hey, man, thanks for telling me your story. That was horrible. Wow. All the things. Money. You definitely need money. Wow, you're, you're broke. Wow, you seriously have bad health issues. Whoa, your, your family's more dysfunctional than mine. We hear all these stories, and then we say, pray for you. And we walk away. When I think God might be saying, hey, I'm inviting you into the mess. Do you, you want to be a part of my kingdom? Because what you really need to do is put them in your car, take them to get food and give them some money. Don't say you're going to pray for them. Give them money. Because that's what they need. 
Love on them. Feed them. Maybe they need to live in that basement of yours. Maybe, maybe it's a single mom that just needs you to take her kids for a little while so she can go eat Chick-fil-A. <laughs> single mom's clapping back. Like, hey, I'm in. Yeah. Preach, pastor. That's preaching right there. And so it's a daily battle. To so I'm going to fight, fight for my will, I'm going to fight for God's will. And those, are, those are things that are in opposition with each other. There's a war, there's a fight every single day to go, I'm going to stand in, in God's will. I'm going to do what He wants. Because here's the deal, God's timing is not our timing. And sometimes it's messy to step into what He wants us to do, right? And pay attention to the needs that are literally right in front of me. But can I just say to you, your ministry will only be as effective as you are present. So show up, be present, see the needs, walk in the Spirit, and delight in your Father by delighting in His children. Whew, come on. And sometimes when you're in the middle of the mess, it's hard to know the overarching story of God, right? It's like 30,000 foot view. I don't know, I don't know. I'm just going to do this thing because this is what I think I'm supposed to do right now. And this is exactly the thing that, that the Israelites find themselves in, in, in the story of God. They weren't different than us. They, they were just humans. And so they're, they're, they're out in the desert now, and they're like, hey, you know what? It's great that we're out here together in the desert, but I kind of, you know what? You know, Samuel, you, you've been a great prophet. Thank you, Samuel, for leading us. You are the man of God. We appreciate you. But, you know, your kids are jacked. We don't want your kids to lead us. And so here's what we were thinking. We really want a king. How about that? That's what we want. We want a king. We want a dude, a big strap, and I want Gaston. You go, you, go, you go find that dude, you know, big job, you know, everything. It's sexy. You, we want Gaston. So they find Saul. You guys know how that turned out. It was bad. But that story is actually pretty interesting. So in 1 Samuel, if you'll read this with me, um, it says in chapter 8, verse 5, they said to him, you're old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now, appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. Have you ever wanted to be like your neighbor? Have you ever seen someone drive up with a new car and gone, I want that. Have you ever seen somebody go, man, if I could just have a house that, that my neighbors have, they just got that new thing. I need that. Or, hey, I saw that my... My co-worker got the new iPhone 10. I, I need the 10. So we want to be like all the surrounding nations. We want to be like what they have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prays to God. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are asking and saying to do to you. It's not you that they have rejected. I need you to think about this through the lens of a father or mother. Like, listen, hey, Samuel, I, I know you're, you know, the babysitter right now. <laughs> but understand, they're not rejecting you. Who are they rejecting? It says, they have rejected me as their king. And as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt. Huh. Forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but you know what? Just warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So that happened. Saul came in and pride got in the way. He wanted to be in control. And he starts taking stuff and demanding stuff. And he was fearful. He had insecurity and self-doubt and all the things that dudes struggle with. And sure enough, it exactly happened exactly like God said it would. And I want you to read one of the most heartbreaking verses in the entire Bible. It says in verse 19, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. They said, no, we want the king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us. And then it says this verse. Ah, oh, it's gross. To go out before us and to fight our battles. I want a man to fight my battle. I'm going to worship a man. Give me Gaston. I want Gaston, not God. Right? That's our human nature. We so easily grow dissatisfied and start to want something other than what we have. Even if it's the presence of God himself. Cloud by day, fire by night. No thanks. Give me this dude over here. 
God's will is great, right? We know, we know He wants us to do things and He wants us to love Him. But you know what? I'd rather have my own will. Like the Burger King motto, have it your way. I want it my way. We all kind of have what I call this terminally discontent syndrome. Dissatisfied with whatever God gives us. If you don't believe me, just go down to the three-year-old room today and see if I'm wrong. They, 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 there's their theology. If you want to hear the theology of a three-year-old that's from birth, each of us are like this. I want what I have, but I also want what you have as well. I'm going to take it. I'm going to hit you with it. And that's exactly what the Israelites are doing. They're saying, I understand though, I'm not judging the Israelites, okay? They, they came from Egypt. It's what they'd seen. It was their worldview. It's what they knew, right? This almighty Pharaoh. And they worshipped him, and he was in control, and he, he dominated and domineered, right? That was, that was who Pharaoh was. And there were these massive temples and shrines, and, and that's what they had seen. It's what they knew. It's what's supposed to be done, because it's what they'd seen. And so, they just wanted to be like the surrounding nations. They just wanted to blend in and be like everybody else. And there they were, in the desert. They were like, I don't like the tent. My tent's not, I want a temple. They have a temple. All the, they have temples and they have a king. You know what, I want a king. I don't want, Samuel, I don't want you. I want a king. And so next week we're going to talk about the temple. I'm really excited about it. But God was, God was their king. And they, they wanted a different king. Today I want to focus on, on the king. Even though they, they had so much better than, than a man, they, they wanted something other than the king of kings. And by the way, can I just tell you something? This is foreshadowing. I don't know if I'm going to give the storyline away for the next two series. But the king of kings can't be contained in any building built by man. I just want to tell you that. So let me back up a little bit. I, we want to first talk about the first time that God experienced the pain of Israel getting into the desert, I just want to remind you the story of how he's saying, yeah, you know what, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're actually rejecting me. And he's been dealing with this pain. He had been wounded really bad by the people of Israel. His, his house, his family did something that really hurt him. And that was when God was like, hey, Moses, come up on this mountain. I have a little chat I'd like to have with you. And he takes his finger and he, he makes the Ten Commandments. And while he's having this conversation with Moses, something horrible happens. I'm going to read that to you, Exodus 32. It says, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come on, man, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, okay, here's the deal. Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. Bring all your earrings, okay? All the people took the gold rings in their ears and they brought it to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Oh. I don't know if you can hear God just go, it was, what? Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar front in front of the calf. Then he announced, tomorrow, we're going to party, man. Come on, show up. We're going to have a festival to the Lord. He says it's going to be to the Lord. And the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry meaning every kind of sin was going on. Hedonism, just feasting on their own desires and sexual immorality and lust and impurity of every kind. It was gross. And the Lord told Moses, quick, listen man, this meeting's going to have to be cut short. You need to go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they've turned away from the way that I commanded them to live. They've melted down gold and made a calf and they've bowed down and sacrificed to it. They're saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so I don't know if you know what idolatry is. I'm going to teach you. 
I'm going to define idolatry for you if you don't know what idolatry is. Idolatry is simply this. Extreme admiration, love, or reverence towards something or someone. So let me explain it kind of like this. Sometimes in our life, we easily forget who's really in control. We easily forget that God is actually wanting our utmost attention, reverence, and love. And then sometimes out of nowhere, maybe you're up late and can't sleep, thumbing through your phone or your own computer, and you just forget really easily that God is your God and He wants you to want Him more than anything else. And you just pull up some porn and you look at something you know you're not supposed to be. Or maybe for you it's a drug. Maybe for you it's just uh, an easy little lie. But we, we sometimes just easily forget and then we lose our minds. And we do something just ridiculous. Hey, I've got an idea. Go get some earrings. Go get some earrings we're going we're gonna to do something with all the gold. So, so they go back crazy. They lose their minds and they're just out of control. And they forgot all that God had done through Moses. And now they give all the credit to a baby cow. What? And it's not by mistake that the first two commandments of the ten, by the way. Can I just remind you what the first two commandments are? It says, you must not have any other God but me. There's number one. Number two. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Clearly, God's serious about his people not placing our affection, our love, or our desires towards any other God but him. God wants us to want him. He wants us to yearn for Him. He wants us to long for Him more than anything else on the planet. So think, I'm just going to make this in terms you'll understand in a world of Avengers, right? Think of, think of Thanos, almighty, powerful God, right? And then there's us, and it's Woody, right? Just Woody. And so what kind of control does Woody have towards Thanos? Nothing. But here's... here's The way I want to say this to you, if you don't understand idolatry, here's how it really works. Here's God. Here's you. He's massive and powerful. You're tiny and nothing. Vulnerable. And yet, what he wants is, will you worship me? Will you make me first? Will you love me first? And anything that comes between you and God is idolatry. So what is it for you? Maybe for you, um, maybe for you it's your finances. And you like to trust in your almighty dollar more than you trust in God. You wouldn't say that. You don't say it out loud. Right? But but my 401k is what's going to keep me secure. Not God. You're not going to say it out loud that I, I'm going to hoard and keep everything for myself instead of giving it to other people. I, it's mine. I earned it. Step off that. I meant to say Jack. But step back, Jack, is probably just as good. So, Or maybe for you it's not, it's not money and you don't love money. Maybe it's technology and you love your technology. We don't say this out loud, but for you maybe it's, it's that, you know what, you're, you love being on your device or your computer or your iPad. And, and you're sitting in your living room and your kids are, hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, grandpa, hey, grandma, hey, will you go out and play with me? Oh, hold on, I, I'm scrolling. Anything that comes between you and God and you spend your time, money, and affections, love, and desire goes towards that, it's idolatry. And so for you, maybe, maybe it is um, your kids. You wouldn't say that out loud. You don't choose, you don't, you don't choose your kids over God, but... Maybe you do. And not only that, maybe you're leading your kids by an example that says, you know what, I I know that one day you're going to be sent out into the world and you're going to have to choose God first, but for now, I'm looking to get you a scholarship and you need to play baseball. And so, I'm not trying to beat you up, church. I love you. 
But there's times where we exemplify for our kids what really matters. And we show them that it's by our own performance that you're going to be able to, to find your worth. And, and you need to be able to f- make a lot of money if you want to have a lot of worth. And sometimes we might be easily leading them down a path that's leading towards idolatry. Those, those things, they're not bad. And I'm not judging you for doing those things. They're good things, actually. But here's the thing. When we turn good things into ultimate things, they become an idol and you're sinning against God. It's really easy. It's dangerous how easy it is to make things and stuff and people even an idol in our life. We, we say it all the time, like, man, that's my childhood hero. Did you, like, you meet him and you hear things people have to say, you're like, you're like idol. We even have a TV show called American Idol. And we, we look to people, right? We want to place the king over us because we need somebody, we need a person to be in charge. Whether it's our president or the pastor. And I just want to challenge you. God wants you to worship him first. He wants you to want him first. You you can make a case that every sin is birthed out of idolatry. Your worship of what you desire leads us to the very worst kinds of evil. And it doesn't happen by chance. We like to say, oh, I don't know how that happened. Yes, you do. Coveting somehow accidentally turned into stealing. Her smile accidentally turned into an affair. The lust that you have accidentally turns into sexual abuse. See, idols are conceived out of our misplaced affections and desires. We have misplaced desires inside of us. I don't know if you knew that. But I long for things I'm not supposed to. And and God wants us to long for Him first. You don't worship by accident. We worship what we love. That's what I'm teaching today. We worship what we love. And I, let's see what happens in, in this story as it unfolds in Exodus 32. Uh, the, this is how God responds to His kids who are worshiping what they love. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made, and he burned it. Then he ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. (laughs) He's mad. That'd be so scary if he did that to my iPhone. He smashes it and puts it in the drinks to drink that. You love it more than me. That's what he did. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, what did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? And he says, don't get so upset, Lord. You yourself know how evil they are. He points fingers. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. And we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here out of the land of Egypt. So I told him, look, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out came a baby cow. I'm sorry. It's crazy. That's, that's his excuse. That's what he's got. I'm just reading the Bible here. He, he's like, hey, I, I don't know. I just, they gave me and blah, blah, wow, baby cow. If I'm honest with you, I, I understand Aaron way more than I like to admit. I understand trying to make sure everybody stays happy. Trying to keep everybody, okay, what do you want? All right, we'll do that. Need him? Okay. Yeah, you don't like the color of the carpet? All right. We we try to please everyone around us. And sometimes pleasing other people is the idol. And God's saying, "I, I want you to please me. And so Aaron was pressured and He allowed the people to place their worship towards another God. And it's amazing to me how quickly we can just forget. Just, oh yeah, I forgot. They replaced their their affection and love towards the living God who had done all these mighty, magnificent acts 
They had seen it with their own eyes. And if we're honest, we do the same thing. We've seen the hand of God in our life. But see, idolatry is really about priorities. Nobody has to ask us to spend money and time on the things that we love. If we love our team, right, Georgia Dogs or whatever it is, you'll pay to sit in the rain, right? doesn't matter how it costs you or how uncomfortable it is. That's my team. Or if it's your hobby, man, you're going to just look for hours for that thing that you want. You're going to sit there and scroll through Amazon for hours and hours, and then when you find it, I can pay whatever it costs. Your actions preach the message of your priorities. I'm going to say that again, and I need a little bit of a response there. Your actions preach the message of your priorities. Ooh, that's hot. I don't know why I did that. That was weird. All I'm saying is God cares how you spend your time and your money because it all belongs to Him. It's not yours. Your life is not for your own. It's for Him. And some people say that, you know, you can best understand idols in your own heart when you sort of slow down your life. If you're trying to figure out, well, what idols do I have? Well, think about what you think about when you're in the shower. When you're sort of resting and given pause. Maybe when you're laying down. Like, what is it that your heart and desires naturally think about? It might be an idol. And so I, I just want to ask you today, church, what is it that you dream about and what is it that you think about? What is it that has the affections of your heart? Because God cares. Is it to follow wholeheartedly and sacrifice after God and build His kingdom or, or are you just focused on building your own kingdom? Are you thinking about an upgrade for your car or new tires or a new stereo? Are you thinking about an upgrade, you know, on your house? You just two knots big enough? What is it that you're trying to go, I just need, I need more and more and more? Because there's two types of people in this world. There's the type of person that's forcefully working hard to advance and grow the kingdom of God. Or there's the type of person that says, I'm the king. I'm going to build my kingdom. God didn't build all this for you so you can build a kingdom for yourself. Because your kingdom's a joke. It's, it's, it's not going to last. It, it's going to be gone in a, about four and a half minutes. So are, are you going to build an everlasting kingdom that's being established on earth by the king of kings? Are you going to choose to say, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can, God, to make you number one. It's going to sit on the throne of my heart and be in charge of everything that I do say, think, or feel. So how do you do that, Blake? Well, here, here it is. Here's my last closing statement. It's going to be mind-blowing. Place God first in every area of your life. Whew. Thanks, Pastor. That's what you got. Yeah, that's what I got. And I think you could come back next week and I could say the same thing. It would be just as relevant. And the week after that, <laughs> years, I could say that. Are you? Are you placing God first? Because Jesus, when he came here, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. So we, we, we have a tendency to view God as like a vending machine. Oh, you know, I, I really need, I haven't prayed in a long time. I need to go to him. I should pray. Or like with my money especially, like, oh yeah, you know what? I, I want a nicer house. I'll give him a little bit. Ooh. God doesn't want us to just take what we want when we want it on our own terms. Jesus wants to be aware that God wants every desire of your heart. He wants all of it. He wants to come and live inside of you and dwell inside of you. And he wants to know that everything inside of your heart, mind, and soul is his. Are there places and crevices and rooms that are dark that you're kind of keeping him away from? Well, maybe you should invite him into that. He can heal it. I don't care what it is. He can restore it. He can make it brand new in a second. You, you can say, God, you know what? I have been hoarding. I, I do have too much. I, I, I don't need all this. God, I'm going to give 
give more than what I've been giving. Whether it's time, whether it's money, whether it's how you raise your kids, I just want to challenge you today. Place God first. He's worthy of your affection. And He's worthy of your worship.